Baptist history is fascinating to me. Church history is fascinating to me. But you understand the revolution or the evolution of theology even among Baptist people. Of course, the evolution of theology among the Catholic Church it was just a, uh, a cover-up for their uh, hellish doctrines. Baptists just disagreed over little different things. Of course, now we're going we're gonna to go here. I had one of my students one time, and, and he was a uh, pedo Baptist. He was a Presbyterian, basically. And he went to Valley Baptist Church, but he didn't believe in church history at all as we taught it, or as we teach it. He said Baptists started in 1611. No, they didn't. <laughs> but there were some Baptists that started in 1611. We're going to talk about them tonight. 1611 was the same time that King James Version come out. Let me go back here. We're going to talk about different people. We're on uh, chapter uh, 12 in uh, John T. Christian's volume 2. And it talks about the Baptists going to different places in America and settling here and there. There were two great leaders in the Baptist ranks, they're sound Baptist leaders, and that was Shubal Stearns and John Gano. Shubal Stearns and John Gamo, Gano. Now, the Baptists here uh, were heavily persecuted, and it talks about that. And the Baptists in North Carolina. North Carolina was settled by the freest of the free. The settlers that were gentle in their tempers and serene in their minds and enemies of violence and bloodshed. Not all of the successive revolution had kindled vindictive passions. Freedom, entire freedom, was enjoyed without anxiety as without guarantees. Now, they went into this area where nobody else was. This is pioneer country like Nevada. You know, we come, when you cross into the Nevada line up here, it said you're in pioneer country. Maryland and I were pioneer, uh, geriatric pioneers coming in here and, and settling this little 8.2 acres we live on here. We had nothing to begin with, and we drilled water well and electricity and all that. Of course, they didn't have that back here. But they did have what you had to drill a well and, and uh, fence your property, keep your cattle in, etc. It said the, uh, the charities of life were scattered at their feet like flowers in the meadows. No freer country was ever organized by man than North Carolina. Freedom of conscience, exemption from taxation, exception or except by their own consent, gratuities in the land to every immigrant, and other wholesome regulations claimed the prompt legislation action of the infant colony. These simple laws suited a simple people and were far as free as the air of the mountains. And when oppression came, it was as rough as the billows of the ocean because the Church of England came in. And when the Church of England or the Catholic Church came into any colony, there was uh, blood to pay. Simple as that. The Baptist movement into North Carolina originated with the separatists of Connecticut. And it was led by Shubal Stearns and Daniel Marshall. And Shubal Stearns was a remarkable man. He was a product of the Whitefield Revival. Now George Whitefield uh, came into America and, and he preached and thousands of people, and this, this was uh, in the late 1700s, uh, they, this thousands of people were converted. He was a product, product of the Whitefield Revival and in 1745 united with the New Lights, the Baptists called, called New Lights. Immediately afterwards, his mind became impressed with the obligation to preach the gospel, and accordingly, he entered into the responsible work, and he continued with the pedo Baptist till 1751, when examining the word of God, he became convinced that in falling, failing to submit to the ordinance of immersion, he had neglected a most important commandment of the Redeemer. Now, see, he was uh, with the Congregationalists, he was with the 
Presbyterians, he was with the Church of England, and they all talked uh, about uh, uh, sprinkling. And you're baptized for your remission of your uh, original sins. And then as he started studying the Bible, then the Bible convicted him. You know when people study the Bible, they become Baptists. That's history. This tells you that over and over again. If they're really studying the Bible, they're going to become Baptists. He had neglected the most important command regime, the futility of infant baptism was also discovered, and he determined to take up the cross and be baptized and unite himself with the Baptist. That sounds like Adoniram Judgeon, doesn't it? This he accordingly did and was immersed by uh, Wade Palmer at Toland, Connecticut in May the 20th, 1751. Now, John Gano and Schubert Stearns were very, very important people, ministers in the American Revolution, but this is pre-revolution here now. We went up and we studied and, and we talked about the hard shells and, uh, and the two seed and everything. This is prior to that, but here's where it all gets started here. For two or three years he continued with his labors in New England, but he became impressed that he must preach the gospel to the more destitute sections of the country. He pursued the southwesterly deck, deck direction, scarcely knowing where he was going. In the course of time he arrived in Opecon Creek, where as has been seen there was already a Baptist church. He met his brother-in-law, Daniel Marshall. This church, under the influence of this new preaching, became very warm and much animated in the religious exercises. They got excited. We're not talking about Pentecostal, but we're talking about they, they, were, they were much impressed with the grace of God. They soon went such lengths as the new light career that some of the less engaged members uh, preferred charges against them in the association. The matter was finally adjusted favorably to the separatists, and the work continued to prosper. Now we have the separate Baptist, we have the particular Baptist, we have the general Baptist, and all of these here are coming to America, but they have different ideas. Now the general Baptists from England were basically, actually the free will Baptists came from that group. They were Armenian, in other words, you're not saved, uh, you have to stay saved every day. They did believe in baptism by immersion, that was the only thing that were baptism, and that group started in 1611. Oh. Now the regular Baptists go back, and the separate Baptists go all, back, all the way back to Paul and, and Peter's preaching. It was not long to Stern settled in, in uh, Guilford County in North Carolina. Here he permanently remained. The great spiritual destitution which prevailed seemed to have induced his removal to that section. Such was the anxiety to hear the gospel preached that people frequently traveled a day's journey to hear a preacher preach. They traveled a day's journey, which might be 20 miles. Mm -hmm. They didn't have uh, Hudson Hornets and Cadillacs and Chevrolets and Ford Model T's back in this day. This was all by wagon or by foot or by horseback. He began his labors by building a house of worship and constituting a church of 16 members. There had been individual Baptists in the state as early as 1695. In May the 2nd, 1718, there was one that pretended to be a physician, former a fortune teller and a conjurer. Always uh, chosen Burgess for the precinct and leading men in our assemblies who was an Anabaptist, now, Anabaptists are true Baptists. They don't accept anybody else's baptism. Anabaptist means to baptize again. You, are, you, you don't accept other people's baptism. You baptize them because you know you've got the authority it handed down from church to church. William Moore, the, the Episcopal uh, rector, says that he had one convert from the sect of Anabaptists. One convert. And he wasn't a Baptist. A baptized one brought up an Anabaptist. Hall likewise rejoiced at Edmonton, May the 19th, 1752, that he baptized four brought up in Anabaptism and Quakerism. Now the Quakers and the Anabaptists were heavily persecuted in America. They had their noses cut off, they had their teeth pulled out, they had their tongues pulled, and iron spikes driven through them. They had their ears cut off. Sometimes they were blinded and sometimes they were executed. 
Mr. Reed likewise baptized the Honorable Chief Justice of the Province of July the 2nd, 1771. He was bred and born an Anabaptist and had never been baptized. Now see, if he hadn't been baptized, he wasn't a Baptist, was he? And as I suspected that he might still retain a particular liking for Anabaptists, I offered to baptize him by total immersion. But he refused and said his prejudices were banished and that he regarded the moral more than the more than the mode. Such are some of the examples. The first church was gathered by Paul Palmer about the year 1727 at a place called uh, Pequimans in the Cowan River in the northeast part of the state. William Soldiner, an excellent man and minister, removed to 1742 to Berkeley in Virginia and settled in Cahokia Creek. Most of these Baptists came from the Burley Church. Lemuel Burkett and Jesse Reed gave the following account of some of those Baptists. Some of, of the churches which are at first composed of the Kuhuki Association were the church at Tosano in Edmont, Edgecombe County, uh, the church in Kuhuki and in Halifax County, the church at the Falls of Tar River in Edmont, Colm County, and the church in Fishing Creek. And in Halifax County, the church at Reedy Creek. And in Warren County, the church in Sandy Creek. In Bertie County, the church in Camden County. In North Carolina, most of these churches, before they were ever formed in association, were General Baptist. General Baptist. General Baptist go back to 1611. Okay? And held the Armenian tenants. We believe that they were descendants of the English General Baptist because we find that some of the original papers of their confession of faith was described by certain elders and deacons and brethren in behalf of themselves and others to whom belonged to both in London and several counties in England and was uh, presented to King Charles II. They preached and adhered to the Armenian or free will doctrines and their churches were first established upon this system. They gathered churches without requiring an experience of grace previous to their baptisms but baptized all who believed in the doctrine of immersion and requested baptism of them. The churches of this order were gathered by elders Paul Palmer and Joseph Parker, who were succeeded by a number of ministers whom they had baptized and of whom we have no reason to believe were converted when they had been baptized or first began to preach. We cannot learn that this is the customary with them to hold the association at all, but met at yearly meetings where matters of consequence were determined. This was the state of the churches until divine providence disposed the Philadelphia Baptist Association to send messengers, Van Horn and Miller, two ministers belonging to that association who lived in New Jersey. Now, at this time, the eastern churches were the sound churches. The Western churches weren't. Now they're going to travel there and they're going to find out what kind of Baptists these people are. And to visit the churches and preach the gospel. It appears that this effort was attended with very happy effect. When they came into North Carolina, some of the members belonging to these churches seemed to be afraid of them. And they were styled by most people as new lights. But by the greater part of the churches, they were cordially received. Their preaching and conversation seem to be with power, and the hearts of the people seem to be open, and very great blessings seem to attend their labors. Through their instrumentality, many people were awakened. Many of the members of the churches were convinced of their error and were instructed in the doctrines of the gospel. These people didn't know the gospel. I preached the Baptist churches that didn't know the gospel. Now, John Gano comes up here pretty soon. Now, John Gano was the man that converted George Washington. Mm -hmm. The doctrines of the gospel and some churches are organized anew. They reorganize these churches with real scriptural baptism. And you believe before you're baptized. You don't, you don't just b baptize and then go to church. There is conversion. There is belief. There is a repentance in, in, in people's lives before you're baptized. 
These churches, newly constituted, adopted the Baptist Confession of Faith, published in London in 1639, containing 32 articles of faith, and upon which the Philadelphia and Charleston Associations are founded at that time. I've got a whole book over there on the Philadelphia Association. And it's customary for the church is thus formed at the first constitution to have a church covenant in which they solemnly agree to endeavor to keep up the discipline of the church. John Gano was appointed by the Philadelphia Association to travel to the southern states. He visited these churches about the year of 1754, and his report to the association led to the visit of Miller and Van Horn. The following year, in the reorganization of these churches, they didn't have any baptism. Free will Baptists don't have any authority to baptize. They just put it upon themselves and they started baptizing each other. They had no lineage that went back to some church that founded them, and they're going to go in here and they were going to reestablish these churches soundly. The visit of Gano was described as follows by Morgan Edwards. Mr. Gano, on his arrival, sent the ministers requesting an interview with them, which they denied, and appointed a meeting among themselves to consult what to do. Mr. Gano, hearing of it, went to their meeting and addressed them in words to this effect. <clears throat> I have desired a visit from you, which as a brother and a stranger I had a right to expect. But as ye have refused, I give up my claim and come to pay you a visit. And with that, he ascended into the pulpit and read for the first, his text following the words, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the text he managed in such a manner as to make some afraid of him, and others ashamed of their shyness. Many were convinced of their errors, touching their faith and conversion, and submitted to an examination. This is what you do, make your confession of faith before a church. Marilyn, when I, when I baptized you, I asked you, were you saved, didn't I? Yeah. Have you repented of your sins? Has he asked the Lord to save your soul? Yeah. And Sharon, I did the same thing with you. Yeah. With all the people that I baptized, I asked thee. That's an examination. Many were convinced of their searching their faith and conversion and submitted to examination. And one minister, hearing this, who stood well with himself, went to be examined and intimidated and intimated to his people that he would return triumphant. Mr. Gano heard him out, and then turning his, his uh, companion said, I profess, brother, this will not do. This man has the one thing needful to see, upon which the person examined hastened home, Upon being asked how he came off, he replied, The Lord have mercy on me, for the, for the northern minister has put a, a mini tickle upon me. Mini tickle, mini, mini tickle, you farson, you know, he put a mini tickle upon him. He knew enough about the Bible to know what mini tickle meant. And the coming of Shubal Stearns brought a new day to the Baptist of North Carolina. He was in every respect an extraordinary man. He was a man of small stature but of good natural parts and sound judgment of learning. He had but little sh share, but yet he was pretty well accompanied, uh, acquainted with books. His voice was musical and strong, and he managed it in such a manner as while to make a soft impression on the heart and fetch tears from the eyes of the mechanically away and anon to shake the very pert nerves and to throw the animal system into tumults and, and perturbations. All the separate Baptists copied after him in tones of voice and actions of body. And some few exceeded him. His character was indisputably good, both as a man and a Christian and a preacher, and his eyes were something very penetrating. There seemed to be a meaning in every glance. Many stories have been told of the enchantment of his eyes and voice. Tendence Lane, who was afterwards himself a minister, tells of the curious effect Stearns had on him. When the fame of Mr. Stearns' preaching, said he, he reached the Yadkin where I lived, I felt curiosity to go and hear him. Upon my arrival, I saw a venerable old man sitting under a peach tree 
with a book in his hand and the people gathered about him. He fixed his eyes on me immediately, which made me feel in such a manner as I had never felt before. I turned to quit the place, but could not proceed. He said I was going to leave, but I couldn't leave. I couldn't proceed very far. I walked about sometimes catching his eye as I walked. My uneasiness increased and became intolerable. I went up to him thinking uh, that a uh, salutation and shaking hands would relieve me, but, but it happened otherwise. I began to think that he had an evil eye and ought to be shunned, but shunning him I could not do. I could not more effect than the bird can shun the rattlesnake when it fixes his eyes upon it. When he began to preach my perturbations and increase so that the nature could no longer support them, I sunk to the ground. If the appearance of Stearns was singular, his methods were even more so. The natives around the little colony of Baptists, although brought up in the Christian religion, were grossly ignorant of its essential principles. Having the form of godliness, they knew nothing of its power. The doctrine of Mr. Stearns and his party were consequently quite strange. To be born again appeared to them as absurd as it did to the Jewish teacher in John the third chapter, which he asked if he must enter into the second time in his mother womb and be born again, having always supposed that religion consisted in nothing more than the practice of outward duties, just going to church. They could not comprehend how it should be necessary to feel conviction and conversion. To be able to ascertain the time and the place of one's conversion was in their estimation a wonderful indeed. You know when you got saved. These points were all strenuously contended for by the new preachers. But their manner of preaching was, if possible, much more novel than their doctrines. The separates in New England had acquired a warm and pathetic address accompanied by strong gestures and a singular tone of voice, monotone. Being often deeply affected while themselves while preaching correspondent affections were felt by their pious hearers, which were frequently expressed in tears and trembling screams, shouts, and acclamations. The people were greatly astonished having never seen things of this wise before. God dealing with people's hearts. Many mocked, many trembled, but the power of God uh, ascended, descended upon them. In process, time, some of the natives became converts and vowed obedience to the Redeemer's scepter. These uniting their labors with their chosen band and powerful and extensive work broke out. From 16, Sandy Creek Church soon swelled to 600 and 600 members in mighty grew the work of God. It went from 16 to 600. There was not always harmony between the regular and the separate Baptist. When a church had been formed in Abbott's Creek, there was a call for Daniel Marshall as pastor. When he was ordained, Stearns was the only separate preacher in the ordination, and so Mr. Ledbetter from the South Carolina was called to sit upon the council. Now you get elders to sit on the council when you get ordained, and they question you. Something of the differences in origin and opinions existing between the regular and separate Baptists is expressed by Burkett and Reed. Some years after the Kukukage Association was established on this original plan in Virginia and some parts of the North Carolina, the separate Baptists, as they were called at that time, increased very fast. The separate first arose in New England and were some of the pious ministers and members left the Presbyterian standing order on account of their formality and superfluity, because they were too extravagant in their peril, because they did not believe their form of church government to be right, but chiefly because they would admit to the ministry only men of classical education. They had to know Greek and Hebrew, or at least Greek and Latin. And many of their ministers apparently seemed unconverted. They were called separate new lives. Some of them were baptized and moved into the uh, southern provinces, particularly elders Shubal Stearns and Daniel Marshall, whose labors were wonderfully blessed in Virginia, North and South Carolina, and Georgia. Many souls were converted as the work of the Lord progressed in many churches. 
were established in Virginia and in North Carolina. Their preachers were exceedingly pious and zealous men, and their labors were wonderfully blessed, and such was a work appeared among these people that some were amazed and stood in doubt, saying, What means this? The Presbyterians and the Church of England, you just lived what you wanted to live like you wanted to live. You cussed, you drank, you did whatever you wanted to do, and you went to church, and you paid your tithes. That's Christian to them. The change of life, the knowledge of the Word of God, the, the uh, what we call obedience to God, the reverence to the Son of God, reverence to the Gospel, they do not. The distinction between us and them was that they were called separates in the Philadelphia, and the Carcel and the Cucky were called regular Baptists. There were from the accounts of the day many evidences that the Baptists were aggressive. The Peto Baptist preacher in Eldon, March the 26th, 1766, was disturbed, for he called for tracts that he may affect the confutation of the dissenters and skeptics in general as the parish abounds with such, especially those of the Quaker and Anabaptist kind. And some proper kinds of tracts distributed among the parishioners would, I hope, be very prevalent to the exploding their heterodox and skeptical tenets as their prejudice don't permit them to come to hear the sermons preached by Orthodox ministers. Governor Tyrone, March the 20th, 1769, complained that the parish was full of Quakers and Anabaptists. Now, they didn't allow Anabaptists. They didn't allow the Quakers. They were going to persecute these people. We're talking about 1769 now. If the first no friend, the later avowed enemy to the mother church. Now, you have to realize that the Church of England came out of, out of the Catholic Church. They didn't change basically much of the rules. That just the church, you're a member of the church, the church is universal. Everybody in the whole, uh, all the colonies, everything of England were all members of the mother church. And you did what they were supposed to do. You stayed away from these other heretics, as, as they called them. It is certain that the preeminence of the Church of England has been obtained over secretaries by legislative authority and has drawn upon their jealousness the disturbances in the provinces have it have inspired no religious sentiments among us and the difficulty in raising the taxes for a want of medium to pay them. They taxed all the people. If you lived in any, any colony, you were taxed. You were fined if you didn't go to, to, to an a Anglican church. You were fined. You were in prison. You were beaten. And it said, makes many parishes very sick to encourage public worship. Alex Stewart of St. Thomas Bath Town, October the 10th, 1760, writing to the secretary of his church, says, When I mention I, I baptize a person by immersion, I should be sorry that it should be thought by the society that was neither through affection or singularity. I assure you, sir, though I know that it is conformable <coughs> to our rubric to practice the primitive Christians of the apostles, <coughs> <clears throat> the primitive Christians and all the apostles baptized by immersion. They knew that. <clears throat> and the Jews before the coming of the Savior generally baptized by immersion. That is the only to keep people from falling off from the church that these persons and some others not mentioned have been baptized by immersion by me. For of late years this province is overrun with the people that is first called themselves Anabaptists. But having now refined upon that scheme, have run into so many errors, and have so bewildered, and I may say bewitched the minds of this people, that scarcely will they listen to anything that can be said in defense of the church. He's talking about the, the England, Anglican Church, Church of England. The church we belong to, as far as may my capacity and abilities would admit, I have done my best endeavors to confute their errors. Now, the problem is, they study their doctrines. They don't study the Bible. The Baptists study the Bible. <clears throat> now, Mr. Woods, son, in 1766, and by the way, I'll have a little book right here. 
This goes back to 17, this book was printed in 1766, by the way. It is a Greek Latin uh, lexicon. And that's it right there. Printed in 1766. Gives the following account of the Baptists. The most zealous among these sects propagate their notions and form establishments are the Anabaptists. For the Anabaptists of Pennsylvania, resolving themselves into a body and determined to settle their principles in a vacant, in a uh, every vacant quarter, began to establish meeting houses also in the borders, so that the Baptists are now the most numerous and formable people, body of people which the church has to encounter within the interior and back parts of the province. But the Baptists have great prevalence and footing, and have taken such deep root there in North Carolina that it is require a long time and pains to grub their labors and their layers. You can't get rid of the Baptists because they're preaching the Bible. But you try to drag them back into the Church of England or into the Catholic Church. And you do that by intimidation and fear. <clears throat> there are great numbers of dissenters of all denominations that have come and settled amongst us. From New England, particularly Anabaptists, Methodists, and Quakers, and Presbyterians. The Anabaptists are obstinate, illiterate, censorious, and uncharitable. The Quakers rigid, but the Presbyterians are pretty at modern, except where they're bigot of, or rigid Calvinist. There were Baptists in North and West Parish, October the 12th, 1735, so that John Boyd says to the Bishop of London, we are very happy in having no different sects or opinions in this part of the county or the country, but I have a great reason to complain of a laodicea and lukewarmness and moral, immorality among the, the Church of England laity, or not laity, but uh, in their pastors and preachers, bishops. Well, lower down in the country, there are many, many Quakers and Anabaptists. In my last journey, I had a great many of them as auditors. Mr. Reed said in the arrival of Mr. Morton on June 20th, 1766, at uh, Brunswick, he was very credible and I believe very timely informed of the inhabitants of the county, invaded the Vestry Act of, by electing the most rigid dissenters for vestrymen who would not qualify, and that the county abounded with dissenters. Dissenters were people that were opposed to the Church of England, by the way. And various denominations, particularly with uh, uh, Covenanters and Cedars and Anabaptists of New Lives, that he would meet with a very cold, if any reception at all, and have few or no hearers, and lead a very uneasy life. C. E. Taylor, in August of 1772, August the 25th, reports from the northern Hamlet County, in my last, I, I acquainted you, there were many great, many dissenters in this part of the country. I don't know what they call themselves. Some term themselves as Anabaptists and some New Life Baptists and others Baptists. I have talked with some of their preachers who are surprisingly ignorant and pretend to illumination and insurance. They are so obstinate and willfully ignorant themselves and teach their fellows to be so too that they will hearken to no reason whatsoever but are obstinate and bent to follow their own observed notions. They didn't have a classical education. They read the Bible. Yeah. They increased surprising in Virginia and some parts of Carolina, but I bless God they uh, rather decreased in my parish. The dissenters in 1761 in February, consonances any fellow who will stand up and preach in any part of the parish. But in their settlements in order to a district and make confusion amongst the rest of the people, this under the name of Anabaptists. To what they in part apply under protection of the law, they have to practice against the laws, which are enforced at present, and marry their own justices. They, now, they, they don't go and get a license to get married. Mm -hmm. People went before the church and they declared themselves to be married. And the church prayed and blessed them. And their names were written down in the Bible. 
And they didn't pay any prices to, to be married or buried. They didn't pay any marriage fees. The courts of law are open to me and a penalty of five pounds, but they would represent me as litigious and, and, <clears throat> and it might submit me to a particular insult. The Church of Warden in Hanover County, October 1759, says, he is obliged to attend six different places in order to render the benefits of his preaching more diffusion and the curb, if possible, an enthusiastic sect called themselves Anabaptists, which is numerous and daily increasing in this parish to which we affirm has already received a check from his labors. There was uprising in North Carolina in 1771 in which the Anabaptists were charged with Governor Tyron and having a part. Now, Anabaptists, basically, Baptists have always gone along with whatever government. It, it, just leave me alone and let me preach. Stay out of my business, just leave us alone. Morgan Edwards makes under the following curious remarks in regard to the battle. Next to Virginia, southward of North Carolina, a poor unhappy province where superiors make uh, complaints of the people and the people of the superiors, which complaints it just show the bodily uh, politic to be like the Israel in the house of Israel. From the sole of the foot to the crown of the head without any soundness, but wounds and bruises and pure putrefying sores. These complaints rose to hostilities in Alamance Creek, May the 10th, 1771, where about 6,000 appeared in arms and fought each other 4,000 regulators killed three uh, Tyronians and 2,000 Tyronians killing 12 regulators besides uh, lodging in the trees and an incredible number of uh, balls which the hunters have since picked out and killed more deer and turkeys than they killed of their antagonist. This historian goes into the relate that the part of the Baptists had in the affair. Governor Tarbone was said to have represented a faction of the Quakers and Baptists who aimed at overturning the Church of England. If the governor said that he here suggested that he must be misinformed, for I made it my business to inquire into the matter and came aware that morning 4,000 regulars, there were only seven of the domination of the Baptists. Out of 4,000, there were seven. And they were expelled from the society. They, they were expelled from the churches that they belonged to. In consequence of, of this resolve, the Anabaptists held in Sandy Creek the second Saturday in October 1769, and if any of our members shall take up arms against the legal authority and aid and abet them that do so shall be excommunicated from this church, excluded. When this was known abroad, one of their four chiefs of the regulators with an armed company broke into the assembly and demanded if there was such a resolve entered in by the association. Their answer was evasive, that way they were in bodily fear. This checked the design much, and the author of the impartial, uh, the impartial Relation, page 16, there in Sandy Creek, the scene met with such opposition on account that it was too hot and rash in some things to, and not legal. One of the seven Baptists by the name of Merrill was executed. He was killed. At the point of death, he did not justify his conduct, but bitterly condemned it, and blamed two men of a different religion for deceiving him into the rebellion. John Barnett, New Hampton, September the 5th, 1770, writes, Last Sunday, Monday, and Wednesday, two of these four New Light Baptist teachers attended our service with many of their people and, and the teachers. I am informed have since delivered themselves in more respectful terms to the Church of England than they were before acute custom. <clears throat> that sect has very much increased in the county and the country among us. However, I am in great hopes that frequent weekly lectures will fix the wavering and draw back many of them who have strayed from us. And they talk about the Baptist. You know, in Baptist churches, color means nothing. You know that? Color means nothing. And here is one of the antagonists with these Baptists. These are likewise many Baptists here who are great bigots. 
but well assured, Reverend Sir, that I will, from a sense of my duty, gratitude to the society, take every prudent method I can capable of to abolish the dissension and make converts to the church, the Church of England. John Barrett, Brunswick Cape, February the 3rd, 1776, writes, New Light Baptists are very numerous in the southern parts of this parish. The most illiterate among them are their teachers. Even Negroes speak in their meetings. They have black preachers. Most black people in early America, even after the Civil War and in the early 1900s, were missionary Baptists. The Black Missionary Baptist Church. The Black Missionary Baptist Churches. I have preached in them. I have preached to their pastors. I have taught their pastors. I'm an old man, see, I, I go way back there. The most illiterate among them are their teachers, even Negroes speak in their meetings. They lately sent one to me to offer the use of his meeting house when I proposed an officiate for two months. There is no question from the colonial records representing the hostile accounts that the Baptists were numerous growing with great rapidity, and they were gi uh, giving the rectors of the Church of England much uneasiness. So they began to direct laws against them. Effort was made to unite the separate and regular Baptists, but it didn't quite, quite exceed. Later on, it did. The Whitefield Revival was the occasion of introducing Baptists into Georgia. The first account of the appearance of Baptists in Georgia was in 1757. Mr. Nichols Bedgewood, who was employed by the capacity of agent to the orphanage of Whitefield near Savannah, had several years previously been convinced of Baptist sentiments. In that year he went to Charleston and was baptized by Oliver Hart, the pastor of the Baptist church in that city. He was soon licensed to preach and his ordination to the ministry took place in 1759. In 1763, he baptized several persons in and about the orphan house, and among whom the uh, Benjamin Stirk, who after became a minister of the gospel. To these persons, who probably formed a branch of the Charleston Church, Bedgwood administered the Lord's Supper, the first Baptist communion ever held in this province. Stirk appears to have been a man of good learning, fine natural parts, eminent for piety and zeal, there was no Baptist church in Georgia. He united with the Baptist church at e U Hall, South Carolina. He soon began to preach and set up places of meeting in his house and at Tuck Seeking, uh, 20 miles higher up in the county, where there were a few Baptists who constituted a branch of the E Hall church. But at the Useful labors of the servant of Christ, they were soon deprived as he was called to his reward in 1770. He died. This is the second sign of the Baptist church in the state. Indeed, it is not certain that ever became a regular church. In the meantime, Botford, a young licensee in the Charleston church, while on visit to the U-Haul church, received an invitation to come and help their feeble church and destitute field. Encouraged by the mother church and accompanied by the pastor, and I talk about the mother church, the church that sent him out as a missionary. He came and preached to them the first sermon of June the 27th, 1771. His labors were highly acceptable. He yielded to their solicitation to remain with them for more than a year. His anxious spirit would not prevent him to remain in one place very long. He traveled extensively, preached in all the surrounding county, and toward the close of the next year, he went still higher up in the river and commenced an establishment of what was then called New Savannah, but now Bosford's old meeting house about 25 miles below Augusta, Georgia, where he had the pleasure of seeking the work of the Lord prosper in his hands. In parts of Georgia where he labored, the inhabitants were a mixed multitude of immigrants from many different uh, places, most of them destitute of any form of religion, and the few who paid any regard to it were zealous churchmen and Lutherans and violently opposed the Baptists. He preached in the courthouse in Burke County, and the assembly at first paid decent attention, but towards the close of the sermon, one of them bawled out with a great oath, Rome has come! 
Out he rushed, and the others followed, and assembly was left small. By the time Bobford got out of his, got to his horse, he had the unhappiness to find many of his hearers heavily drunk and intoxicated. When the rum came, they went out and left the church and started getting drunk. And fighting. An old gentleman came up to him and took his horse by the bridle, and in a prime, profane dialect, most highly extolling him at his discourse, swore he must drink with him and come and preach in his neighborhood. These people want the church to get drunk. Sound like Corinthian church, didn't it? It is now no time to reason and reprove, and as preaching was at Bobford's business, I accepted the old man's invitation and made an appointment. His first sermon was blessed with the awakening of the host's wife, and one of his sons became religious. And others in the settlement to the number of 15 were in a short time brought to the knowledge of the truth. They were religious. They went to church to hear something new for entertainment. And then they got drunk. And the old man himself became sober and attentive to religion, although he never made a profession of it. We'll finish right there on page 211. And we'll come back to it our next class. I hope you're learning something from this. It gets pretty bloody later on. When the Baptists established themselves pretty well in these areas, the Church of England and the Catholics and even the Presbyterians began to persecute them. And all this was done so you can hear the Word of God today and have freedom of religion. Once the American Revolution was over, there was no freedom of religion in America. Still, they wanted to have state churches and every person forced by law to go to church. They didn't think they could keep society together without forced religion. And the Baptists and Thomas Jefferson wrote the First Amendment to the Constitution. The Baptists didn't want to certify the Constitution to accept it because it didn't have freedom of religion in it. But they did confirm it and then they by the help of Thomas Jefferson, they wrote the First Amendment, freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Our Father, thank you for this message tonight from the history of your people. As you said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, as we go out into the world, we're supposed to preach the gospel, baptizing the converts in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to guard with their lives all things that you have commanded in your word. And you said, I'll be with you until the end of the age, and we hope, we pray, and we believe that. Please forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name I pray.